Well, the market is moving around and around and around. It's going up and down and, uh, you know, in very trying to decide just exactly what direction it wants to take this morning. And that's also true of Tesla. We'll check it out in a few minutes and see where things are. But as of the moment, as of this exact moment, Tesla was ahead of buck seven. Uh, AJ this morning talking about the FOMO around events. He says, this analysis looks at how Tesla performed prior, at, and after the last 10 key events, excluding earnings events, not any earnings events, so any kind of event. Now, I would have divided it into two kinds of events, which would have been uh, the um, employee uh, inducement events, the, the events which are like uh, AI day or whatnot, which are designed to get folks to come to work for Tesla and the kind of events that are reveals. I don't know if there's any difference between the two, but his this is an analysis of all events. He says an ultra short-term daily trading. In the 10 days prior to earnings, no consistent pattern emerged. However, for events saw a significant sell-off immediately after the event. Now, I'm, I'm getting a little bit confused here. He says in the 10, he said, this is excluding earnings. And then he says in the 10 days prior to earnings, no consistent pattern emerged. Interesting. However, for events saw a significant sell-off immediately after the event, a drop of 6 to 10%. I think we've all seen that. We, were, we all remember those. All right. In the two weeks trading window prior, on a rebased basis, we can see that in most cases, eight out of 10, Tesla was down in any of the five days after the event relative to the trading day 11 days prior. In other words, exiting trimming two weeks before an event led in 80% of the cases to superior returns. In the two cases where the exit trim strategy was inferior, gains were very modest. He says, bottom line, this analysis suggests that upside downside risk is highly asymmetrically skewed, favoring an exit trim st strategy before the event. I think that's what Larry's been saying, right? Uh, so uh, uh, continue to think that this is true. I think we will see a run up prior to the event uh, coming on 1010. Um, I think we will have a run up at about 265. This is a very, very significant event. I think we would have to go back, as Elon says, we'd have to go back to look at the Model 3 launch uh, or reveal in order to see anything this significant. That's according to Elon. So the tariff discussion continues, and a key reason for tariffs is to onshore more U.S. manufacturing. I've, I've been talking about tariffs. I, I, if you haven't heard what I've had to say about tariffs, it, just in the very briefest sense, tariffs do not raise U.S. retail prices. Please understand that. It's just illogical, completely illogical to believe that tariffs raise U.S. prices. They can, and in some cases they will, but in other cases they won't. So here's the, here's the basic logic here. If I can raise my prices, I'm a retailer, and I've got uh, you know some water bottles, some bicycle water bottles that I'm selling. If I am selling them now for four ninety nine, and I can sell them, and and I could sell them for six ninety nine instead, I would. If I thought that was the right price, I would raise my price to six ninety nine. The fact that all of a sudden there's a tariff on the product that raised my cost doesn't mean I can just turn around and sell them for six ninety nine. It's just not logical. I've been selling them at the highest price I possibly could based on market conditions. So no, tariffs don't raise prices any more than a change in, uh, let's say, the if you're importing and you have a change in the value of the, the two currencies which raise prices, or the manufacturer in China or in Taiwan or Japan or someplace else, they might just raise prices. They might just have to raise their prices. There's all kinds of reasons. You might have a, a, an increase in the price of what the container shipping costs. All those things can raise your landed cost and or wholesale cost if you're buying from a from an importer or wholesaler. So um, the fact that a tariff is imp imposed does not raise prices. It could and it can, but it doesn't necessarily 
raise prices. And in most cases, won't. Most cases, what you're going to do is you're going to, if the China raises the, if the China has to pay a 10, or if we, if the importer has to pay a 10% tariff, the importer is going to go back to the manufacturer and say, hey, you're going to have to give up 10% or we're going to lose all the business. That's how it actually works in real life. Okay, so anyway, but this is what Jeff Lutz has to say, because one of the main benefits of tariffs, of course, is to make, hold on to or increase your U.S. manufacturing or the whatever country it is. But in the case we care about, is it, for the most part in this audience, cares about is the U.S. manufacturing. So Jeff says here is one of the huge benefits of onshoring. Design for manufacturability is far more effective when the engineering and manufacturing are co-located permanently, where the engineers have to camp out in the factory and eat their own dog food, where design for manufacturing um, is done more efficiently, process times go down, factory yields are higher, and costs go down. He says that uh, that uh, J.D. Vance, who was he was referring to this uh, 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 thing on one of the TV programs last night, he says, J.D. Vance is right at the end. We are losing and have lost much of our manufacturing tech edge by only designing in the U.S. and building overseas. All right, this from Dylan Loomis this morning, kind of a, an op-ed piece. He says, when Tesla starts deploying robo-taxis and things start scaling quickly, it's going to be an incredibly vindicating moment for so many people. Years of Wall Street analysis, analysts saying that regulatory hurdles are too great and it's not possible without LIDAR. Years of the media mocking the technology and putting it on blast, calling it a danger to everyone on the road, where influencers take money from OEMs to review or implicitly speak highly about inferior technology. Years of the average consumer paying no attention to the technology that's going to save millions of lives and give people thousands of hours back. Lives, I might add, that will undoubtedly be future generations in the family tree of the very ones that derided Tesla for trying to solve the problem. Years of Tesla investors FOMOing into the stock, expecting mon uh, monotonic appreciation and then quickly selling and then speaking negatively about Tesla out of emotion thanks to their own unrealistic expectations. But for the investors that did the homework to understand why Tesla's approach is different and why it makes their upside much higher and much closer than any of the competition. And for the thousands of Tesla employees that have dedicated their lives and worked long, challenging hours under immense pressure that have been involved in any aspect of enabling Tesla's FSD. And for the fans that have spent years fighting FUD, spreading positivity about Tesla and highlighting the incredibly impressive things Tesla has done while facing absurd levels of opposition, I don't know when this moment is coming. But I followed the company daily now for work for as part of his, you know, is you, you uh, like like me with his YouTube channel. He says I followed it daily for five years. Nothing in life is guaranteed, but I really have never felt confident, felt more confident that Tesla is going to figure this out. Yes, I've shared my unfiltered experience with FSD right now, and I'll repeat, it's not ready yet. There's a lot of challenging work ahead, but. As a long-term thinker by nature, that moment is going to be quite special, not just for Tesla stock appreciation and lives changed financially, but knowing you filtered through the noise and distractions and found the truth. To every, everyone who's on track to be on the right side of history with this one, cheers. <laughs> All right, and speaking of amazing things that Elon Musk is doing, SpaceX astronauts walked outside the Polaris Dawn this morning. They have done their two-hour walk. Billionaire Jared Isaacman and SpaceX employee Sarah Gillis stepped out of their Groot, uh, Groot Dragon spacecraft to amazing views and amazing opportunity and excitement. And uh, that is just one more feather in the cap of the various companies that Elon is running. AJ says this also this morning, Western automakers, with one obvious exception, Tesla have fallen so far behind an EV tech that the Chinese government has grown concerned with Chinese companies moving EV tech outside of China. Oh boy, he says, how times have changed. Bloomberg reported that China's Ministry of Commerce held a meeting with more than a dozen automakers and told them not to make any auto-related investments in India and strongly advised them to ensure that advanced EV technology stays at home. The government encouraged Chinese automakers to export knockdown kits. And knockdown kits comprise domestically produced key components shipped abroad for final assembly. 
Common misconception is that key components reflect the key technology. This is not the case. In most cases, the core technology lies in the production method. China doesn't want advanced production methods unlocking low cost and highly competitive parts to leave China. And yet on the other side of the coin, we know that they are uh, encouraging, they're, they're spending billions and billions of dollars in Africa and South America uh, to um, you know, get those companies, those countries to be uh, the next resource for inexpensive labor. Um, yeah, I can't have it both ways, China. All right, this is Randy Kirk. Hit the like and subscribe and notify button and then join Patreon. That's all I've got to say about that. U.S. citizens that newly applied for unemployment insurance benefits. So this is the, uh, uh, the, the uh, <laughs> yeah, this is, you know, the initial, that's what I call it, initial unemployment claims. Every Thursday we get this. U.S. citizens that newly applied for unemployment insurance benefits reached 230,000 in the weekend in September 7th. This is about almost exactly the number that they were expecting this week and completely, totally within the range of what it normally is. They print, the uh, prints come in above initial, cons initial consensus 227, who cares? And we're a tad higher than the previous week at 228. Further details of the publication revealed that the advanced seasonally adjusted insured unemployment rate was 1.2% and the four-week moving average was 230, an increase of just 500,000 from the previous week. So no real news there. I mean, when I say root, no, no news, it just means uh, not, uh, not, not, not going to drive the market one way or the other. Um, okay, the European uh, Central Bank did lower their rates by the 25 basis points as expected. Now, the key number today, although not nearly as important as CPI, was PPI, the Producer Price Index. For so that came in today. They call it. They call it the. This is from their website. The Producer Price Index for final demand increased 0.2 percent in August, seasonally adjusted according to the U.S. Bureau of Labor Statistics. Final demand prices were unchanged in July and then rose 0.2% in June. So we have 0.2% in June, flat in July, and then back up to 0.2% in uh, in uh, August. Um, on an adjusted basis, the index for final demand was 1.7% for the entire 12 months ending in August. Now, you know, again, producer prices don't necessarily go through the chain. All This is kind of what I was saying a minute ago about tariffs. Just because... A producer price is lowered doesn't mean that they can pass along that lowered amount to uh, the next low, the next low. It's a wholesaler, whether it's a manufacturer, um, you know, it, you sometimes you can pass along that decrease uh, or that not as high increase, but sometimes you can't. Sometimes you have inventory still left over. Sometimes it takes months and months and months before it can pass along. Sometimes there are transportation costs between manufacturing and wholesale and, and more uh, transportation costs up to retail that may mean that the landed cost for the retailer is still higher. So there's so many things going on. The August rise in the index for final demand can be traced to a 0.4% increase in prices for final demand services. The index for final demand goods was unchanged this month, but the uh, final demand price less foods, energy, and trade services advanced 0.3% in August, the same as it did in July. For the 12 months and in August, that index, which is the core index, was up 3.3%. That's a pretty healthy number. Final demand services. Prices for final demand services rose 0.3%. 4% in August after declining 0.3 in July. So a little bit of uh, makeup there. Nearly 60% of the increase is attributable, attributable to a 0.3% advance in the index for um, the, the core index. Margins for final demand trade services moved up 0.6%. So in contrast, the index for final demand transportation and warehousing services decreased. So a little product detail, a 4.8% rise in the index for guest, 4.8, 4.8% rise in the index for guest room rental was a major factor in the August advance in prices for final demand services. The indexes for machinery and vehicle wholesaling, automotive fuels and lubricants, retailing, fuels and lubricants retailing, residential real estate loans, professional and commercial equipment wholesaling and furniture retailing moved higher. 
Prices for airline passenger services, yay, fell 0.8%. The indexes for food and alcohol retailing and for membership dues, admissions, and recreational facility use fees also decreased. All right, final demand goods. Prices for final demand goods were unchanged in August, but they rose 0.6% last month. In August, the indices for final demand goods, less food and energy, and for final demand foods advanced 0.2% and 0.1% respectively. So you've got the the uh, the headline number was point, uh, uh, was flat, uh, but the core was uh, 0.2 and uh, the uh, core core was 0.1. Uh, in contrast, prices for final demand energy fell 0.9%, which is what kept the entire goods uh, category to zero. All right, so again, I don't think there was anything there that would be challenging the decision by the Fed next Wednesday. Some things good, some things bad. A little bit of, uh, you know, last month a big increase here, so therefore this month not so much, and vice versa between the goods and services. But overall, I think we're looking at continued price pressures. I think I think anybody that thinks that prices are uh, uh, right now, at least, are headed towards zero, are headed towards negative territory, or it's still not correct. It's hard to say what is keeping price pressures on, but mostly I think it has to be labor, even though people are saying, no, labor. But we saw so many examples in the Beige Book elsewhere where labor is still going up at 4%, 5% per year. And that is, I, you have that. That has to go into uh, the equation when you're when you're making your decisions about what you're going to charge. Again, you can have all these prices, uh, whether it's tariffs, whether it's raw materials, whether it's transportation, whether it's labor. All the various costs that go into the final cost of uh, as you make your decision about what you're going to sell something for at retail or a service that you're going to provide at retail. All of those, you can have price pressures from all of those things and yet not be able to pass it on. And so that's where you get this uh, 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 profit. Uh, <laughs> your profit gets compressed because you're getting hit with higher prices. This is what the this is what these um, uh, small business people were saying in the uh, in the Federation of Small Business People. That that number, they're saying that their profits are being compressed because they're getting hit with higher prices in labor and higher prices in, in their goods, but they can't pass them on. So that's where we are right now, in my opinion. And um, so is it stagflation? I, I don't think it quite qualifies for stagflation, but it's a pretty darn rough market right now. And so anyway, let's see what let's see how the market is responding. Um, an hour after the opening bell, uh, where are we now? So the Dow is down 52.72, but the NASDAQ is up 83. NASDAQ had been down, had been up, had been down, back up again. Same thing with the Dow. The S&P is up 12 and Tesla is up a buck 57. Seems like it's trying to stay above the line. Apple down a bit. Um, Microsoft down a bit, but the rest of the Magnificent Seven are up, uh, including Meta up eight and NVIDIA up 278. Uh, Kathy Woods are mixed, a little bit of this, a little bit of that. Uh, a lot of single digit uh, changes, not any real big significant moves. Let's look at the percentages. We've got the Dow down 0.12%, the NASDAQ up 0.47%, S&P up 0.22%, and Tesla up 0.5%. So looking like an okay day for uh, Tesla so far. Okay, let's go ahead and look at those bonds. And what we've got in the bonds this morning is up 2.5. So so the bond market, oh, it's not uh, changed, point, up point, uh, 3.2 basis points. So the bonds are up this morning pretty significantly, 3.2%, uh, at 3.685. That's still a good number. Um, so this might be just profit taking um, on good bond moves the last few days. Um, it could, I don't think it's the PPI overall. I don't think it's changing anything. 25 basis points, I think, is locked for next Wednesday at this point. Uh, the two-year is up 2.4. So that uh, provides an almost two basis point difference between the two. 
And the two month is actually down this morning. Look at that. <laughs> so moving in the in the direction that we expect it to move, I, I really believe that the two month being still over 5%, um, not investment advice, but that's coming down. <laughs> I, I don't know what to tell you, but that's coming down. Uh, not investment advice. Okay, let's go ahead to the oil. What we've got in the oil business is we've got up this morning, 1.32 for Texas, 1.17 for Brent. That would put us at 68, 64, still under 70 for Texas, and Brent at 71, 79. Natural gas down a bit this morning after screaming up uh, the last couple of days, but barely 0.18% at 2266. We've got gold all time high by a lot. 2573 up 31 this morning. The old all time high was 2560. We're now at 2573. Wow. Okay. And, but silver following along up 2.7 this morning, but still not over 30, 2970. Copper going along for the ride up 1.18% this morning at 4.189. You know, commodities, uh, I don't haven't studied the commodities enough to be able to really make a lot of predictions right now, but using the Randy rule, commodities are really beaten down. Mm. So over the next year, I think we can start to see commodities uh, having some kind of a move. Um, the dollar up against both the yen and the euro, up uh, 0.13 against the yen, up 0.18 against the euro. Uh, Bitcoin getting a little rebound this morning. We're now at 58,503, up 934. So overall, over the last couple of days, moving back towards that 60 level again. And uh, there you go. Um, let's go back one last time and look at where if Tesla has moved. Tesla is uh, a buck seven. So yeah, it's uh, it, the market is moving up and down a lot around that zero mark this morning. Um, and not a lot of directionality, uh, not uh, pretty good evidence that what I said is true, that the PPI is not impacting the markets very much this morning. And they're just trying to decide how to position themselves going into that very interesting next week that we are coming up to. All right. So later on this morning, CERN basher, or maybe not. <laughs> so CERN has a big surprise coming. And we'll talk about that when CERN is on. It may turn out that he's not on until tomorrow. Not 100% sure. But of course, we will have an exciting and interesting spellbinding program somewhere around 11 o'clock this morning. If it's CERN or something else, could be uh, Brian Wong. Um, and then uh, tonight we've got uh, Bradford Ferguson, of course, because it is Thursday. And uh, Bradford, I'm sure, will have plenty to say about the uh, market action this week and about hopefully maybe Bradford has got some uh, new toys. Maybe he's gotten his summons on his vehicle, uh, on his car. Maybe he's gotten his parking on his truck. We'll find out when we talk to him tonight. Okay, that's all I got for you right now. It's been great talking to you in case you were thinking you'd like to do it. Patreon, you could join Patreon. It's been, it's a, see you, see you later today.